Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua. And while you're turning there, out on our little table, when you exit the double doors here to the right, we have some uh, Easter Sunday worship invitations. And I'd like for you to grab a few of those and take them home and then uh, go to your neighbors and invite them. Say, look, we're having Easter Sunday. You're my neighbor. Just want to invite you to come out to church with us. And also, Bruce has ordered some more gospel tracts. We uh, fold these together and pass them out and we go door knocking like we did yesterday. But I left them flat out there. There's some envelopes if you want to take a gospel track and an invitation and mail it to a family member in town or someone and try to encourage them to come to church on Easter Sunday. Amen? And I hope that you'll take advantage of these uh, uh, opportunities, and I pray that God will use it so that Christ will be glorified and his church would be built up. Amen? Let's take our Bibles, I said, and turn to Joshua, chapter number 7. I want to read the first 13 verses or so in Joshua chapter 7. This is probably a very familiar story. And if you're reading through the Bible with us this year, and I hope that all of you are, some of you have a little different schedule than what I'm on, whatever schedule you're on, please keep reading so when you get to the end of the year, you'll be able to say, I've read the entire Bible. Amen? If you've never done that, that's the least goal that you ought to set as a Christian, right? right. Wouldn't you be embarrassed to stand before God on the day of judgment? And he said, well, how'd you like my book I gave you? And you have to say, Lord, I never even read it. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? And so you ought to at least uh, plan on trying to read through it this year. If you are following a Bible reading schedule, you've already read six Books of the Bible. That's pretty good. Amen? So you keep on going. It'll be Christmas time before you know it. And you'll be ending up Revelations and and thankful that you were consistent throughout the year and read it. So Joshua chapter number 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up view the, and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. It's not going to take much to defeat this enemy. Verse 5, And the men of Ai smote or killed of them about thirty and six men, For they chased them from before the gate even unto Shebarim and smote them in the going down whereof their hearts, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Israel, they were so proud. I don't just send a few and they were defeated and their hearts melted. And Joshua, the leader of Israel, tore, tore his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us in the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ or surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? Notice how the Lord responds to this prayer. And the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. 
Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Stop your praying. Stand on your feet. Why would he tell him that? Israel has sinned. They have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and disassembled also. And they have put in even among their own stuff. I want to draw your attention now to verse 12. Okay, are you there with me? Mm -hmm. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be, what's the next words? With you any more. Except you destroy the accursed from among you. Up. Sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to come before you. Lord, you know all things. You know our hearts better, more clear than what we could ever understand our own heart. And God, you know the need that's in our life. And we pray, God, that you would allow the Holy Ghost of God to speak to each and every individual in this service. Lord, if there are some in this service that are lost without Christ on their way to hell, Lord, alarm them, help them to sense conviction God, give them a grave concern about their eternal destiny and compel them to come to this altar and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. And God, also, I pray for your children. Lord, if our hearts are not right with you, if we have sinned against you, Lord, if we need to get before you and admit that we have done wrong, that we've broken your word and we've sinned against your name, Lord, help us to Walk down to this altar and get things right with you. Lord, help us to understand the message I think that you have for us this morning. And Lord, help us to remember this message so that we might walk with you, that you might be with us. And Lord, we'll praise you for what you do, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. I have not really planned on preaching like a series of sermons. But if you look back and think about what I believe that God has been trying to get us to understand, I think you'll see a little bit of a pattern. Remember, I started a little while back preaching to you about the need for us to walk with God. How many of y'all remember that? Uh, uh, We don't have it recorded (laughs) because the guy up here don't know how to operate this thing. But I hope that it's recorded in your heart. Remember Enoch, Enoch walked with God. And remember, that was a rare thing. When you read the Bible, you only find a few people that the Bible says that that person walked with God. It's such a rare thing that Enoch is the only man that it says he walked with God and was not for God took him. God enjoyed such sweet fellowship with Enoch. He said, Enoch, just come on home. (laughs) Don't worry about death. Just, I want you up there with me. Isn't that wonderful to know that you can have that kind of a relationship with the creator of all things? Isn't that amazing? And look, God wants that relationship with you. You are as close to God as you want to be. It's not God's fault that there's a distance between you and him. Amen? He's done everything possible to have an intimate relationship with you. And if you don't have an intimate relationship with him, it's because you don't want it. Right? So Enoch walked with God. It was rare. Remember, it's also a reality. You can walk with God. And there are great rewards walking with God. Amen? Amen? And then we came across the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6. Remember this one? 
He said, be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. You're going to cross over. Don't be afraid of the enemies. Why? Remember why? Because God is with us. Isn't that a great truth? Here is how he ends that verse in Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. And I say to all of us, that's so true. And if you're a born again Christian, guess what? The Holy Ghost of God lives on the inside of you. And no matter where you go, God is with you. If it's a hospital bed, if it's a prison cell, if it's at work, if it's at home, if it's driving down the road, it doesn't matter where you are, who's with you? And that, I tell you, I don't know about y'all, but to me, that is exciting. Yes, it is. Isn't that a blessing to know God? He's not just out there somewhere. Where does he live if you're a Christian? Inside of me. <laughs> Isn't that good? Amen. That he's given us of his divine nature? Wow. No wonder we have these holy desires to live for God. Because the spirit of God lives within each of us. Isn't that good news? Not only did he say, I'll be with you, he also said, I will not fail thee. Isn't that good? He said, I'm going to cross the Jordan with you. I'm going to to be with you. And I will not let you down. You will defeat the enemies. And then he said, and I'm not going to forsake you. You get sometimes you get in some rough spots. I have been in some rough spots myself, and the flesh start and the devil starts saying, Where is your God at? Where is your God? Why don't he do something? Have you ever read the Psalms? The Psalmist David went through that, didn't he? Well, if you know what the Bible says, you can rebuke the devil. You can say, He's with me, he will not fail me, and he will never leave me. And you can stand on that promise. Amen. So God has proven himself faithful, right? They crossed the Jordan. God divided the river just like he did the Red Sea. They walked across on dry ground, right? They collected stones and set it up in the middle for memorial. Did it on the other side. They said, look what God did. He brought us into the Jordan. (laughs) Remember they conquered Jericho. Man, that great walled city, they, uh, some, I remember reading some time back, they said seven chariots could r- uh, race around that walled city. It was such a massive wall. Around the entire city, they could race side by side around. That's a massive wall. Seven chariots could race around it, didn't it? And God calls the wall to come down. All right, now they're going forward. Brother Randy, they're doing what God said and they come against this enemy. It's not a big enemy. Little old old AI. We don't need much. You know, two, maybe 3,000. That's all we need to defeat them, right? They go down to fight the enemy and all of a sudden they're being whooped. (laughs) They're being, I mean, men are dying. They're starting to run. They're not winning. Where is God? I thought you said you'd be with us. I thought you said you w- we would not fail. We're failing. I-, I thought you said you wouldn't forsake us. It looks like we've been abandoned. We're losing the battle. What's wrong? It's a great lesson here. It's a lesson I think all of us need to kind of remind us. You know what happens to us? What happens to us is we get saved. But there's such joy. We live in the light of God's presence. And then after a while, we start doing the same old things we did before we got saved. And then we just kind of get used to this Christianity where we know the Bible's true. We know we're going to go to heaven. But... I mean, to live in victory, to conquer the entire land. You know, is that really what God wants? Yes, that's what he wants. 
And the reason that we live and we're not living in the presence of God is because we make the same mistake Israel made when they went against Ai. Right? We make the same mistake that Israel made when they went to fight against Ai. They were defeated in battle. 36 men died. And I do want to say this to you, to all of us. There, there's going to come a time in your Christianity, in your Christian life, where you're doing the things that you know that you ought to do. And when you pray, you're going to pour out your heart to God. And those prayers are going to roll out of your lips. And it's going to hit the floor like a, a solid block of concrete. Wow. And you're going to say, what in the world is going on? And you're going to get up and read your Bible and you're going to have no spirit to read the Bible. And you're going to go and pray and you're going to try to pray and, and you're going to try to get a hold of God and you're, it, it's just going to be bland. You're going to feel like that you're a hypocrite. What am I? I'm just saying words here. I, I don't, I'm not really talking to God. I, I, what's wrong with me? And sometimes you'll go through a long period of time where you can't seem to sense the presence of God at all. I can say this to you. Be patient. Amen. That's right. And don't give in to the flesh. The devil is trying to convince you to walk away from God at that point. That you've got to stand on those promises that Amen. God gave you. Amen. It's not about feelings. Mm -hmm. It's about faith. Amen. God said it. Brother Danny, and he cannot lie. I may not feel it. it may, a thrill might be not be running down my spine. I may, not, I, may not, I may not feel like my prayers are getting off the floor. But God is true. God is faithful. He can't lie. He'll always keep his word. Amen? I tell y'all, sometimes my dad, when he was just a young man, he, he shared this with me. When he was 16, he was called to preach. And daddy said they'd get in prayer meetings sometimes. He said, I felt God's presence. He said the room would light up. It would brighten up with God's glory. And then he said, I went through a time though. I'd pray and I'd beg God. I'd fast and nothing. No matter how much I prayed, no matter how long I prayed, nothing, no light, no God, nothing at all. And he made the tragic mistake of quitting and going into the world. I wish he had a pastor there to say, uh, Mr. Caps, that happens to every Christian. Because God is testing you. God is testing you. Do you want the fuzzy feelings? Or do you want him? Do you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying this to say to some of you, sometimes you'll feel like God is nowhere near and he's just as near as he's ever been Amen. and God wants you to keep on crying out to him. Amen? Amen? But why did these folks suffer such a tragic loss? First of all, because of self-reliance, self-confidence. Did you see what they did in verses 3 and 4 and 5? They said, this is just a little old place. <laughs> It's just a few people. We can do this. We can handle this. Listen, we don't need God for this. You say, preacher, they didn't say that. It sure implied, though, isn't it? How many of y'all remember another uh, great man of God? A mentor to all of us in the scriptures. His name is Peter. And Peter said, Jesus said, all of y'all are going to turn your back on me. You're all going to deny me. And Peter said, Lord, I will not do that. I will die for you. I would never do anything like that. They'd ha they'll have to kill me first. How many of y'all think that's what he was saying? And Jesus said, no, Peter. That rooster's going to crow. And you're going to deny me. In fact, you're going to deny me three times. 
three times. And you know the story, right? He's down there by the fire and they say, Aren't you a Galilean? I think you, I think you, aren't you a follower of Jesus? No. I don't know the man. I, I know, I, see, I saw you with Jesus, I know. No, I don't know anything about the man. Are you sure? And what does he do? He uses curse words. If anything's going to convince him, it's going to be that, right? You know, some of us really need to clean up what we say. Sometimes you can say things and they're off, they're off colored. They're inappropriate. Right? Christians ought not to use those kind of comments. Amen? And Peter's using those comments to say, hey, I don't know it. Why did Peter fail so miserably? Because Peter was trusting in Peter. Why was God not present with them? Because they didn't need God. You know, when little David went up against Goliath, Everybody else in the army was just scared to death, weren't they? Yeah. He comes on the scene, little old little boy, and he says, what is going on here? And it's well, that, that giant said, if we go out there and fight him one-on-one, if we beat him, we win. They'll surrender to us. If they beat us, we have to surrender. He said, why, ain't y'all, why don't y'all go out there and whoop him then? They said, look, he's a giant. He's trained. He said, yeah, but this is the Lord's army. We're God's people. We represent Yahweh. This is not our battle. It's the Lord's battle. He goes out there and, and Goliath said, Are you are y'all making fun of me? Are you really going to send this little child after me? Is that what he said? And he and little David said, You come out here with your spear and your armament and your years of training, but I come out here in the name of the Lord of hosts. But you know what? David faced another battle. It wasn't a big battle at all in his mind. You know what? When you go through a great victory as a Christian, you better watch yourself. Because there is a problem coming right around the corner. Great victory, Jericho. Little AI, they fell miserably. David's supposed to be out warring and he's at the house in the palace and that's, you know, just a common day. He's on the rooftop, he's looking around and all of a sudden he sees a woman. And instead of saying, Brother Dan, this is the Lord's battle. This is God's battle. I, I, I got to trust the Lord in this. God will give me victory. He said, who's that woman? So instead of inquiring of the Lord, he inquired about her. Y'all know the rest of the story? He faced the giant and won the victory. He faced this situation and was defeated because sometimes we think we can handle it. And when we do, we're we're in dangerous territory. You know what God will do? He'll say, if you think you can handle it without me, help yourself. And by the way, you and I, listen, you and I need to learn to trust God, God, not just for the big things, but even the little battles. How many of y'all would agree with that? Amen. You need to learn it. That's why you need to pray about everything. Because in praying about everything, you're saying, God, I'm not trusting me. I'm trusting you. And as long as you rely on the Lord, guess what? He is there. He will not fail you. You'll see his power. God will give you victory. Why, why did they not have the presence of God? Because they were self-confident. Another reason they didn't see the sense of presence of God is they, there was no supplication. You know, when they faced Jericho, how many of y'all remember this? Joshua's out at night late and, and he's praying and all of a sudden he meets this man and he says, are you for us or are you for the enemy? And the Lord of hosts says, neither. 
It's not what side you're on. Are you on my side? Right? Joseph, it's, uh, Joshua, it's not that am I on your side or their side. Are you on my side? And guess what happens? He gives him instructions. Walk around the wall. Six days, seven days, the second time. Don't say a word. Blow the trumpet. The wall will fall. You'll get the victory. And it happened just the way the Lord said it would. Why? Because the Lord told him what he wanted him to do. Amen. If you have time later on, they go and read Joshua chapter 8. You know what happens in Joshua chapter 8? They say, Lord, what are, we, what are we supposed to do about AI? He said, this is what you do. Send your army again. Withdraw like they're winning the battle. And then the ones that you set up to ambush them, when they get out of the city, you go in the city and you'll win the victory. They did what God told them to do. And they won the victory over this little small area. Why? Because they got a hold of God and God told them what to do. What are you saying, preacher? You say, preacher, I don't know where God is. I can't sense God's presence in my life. I live my Christian life all the time. I've never heard God speak. I had a pastor friend of mine tell me, I've never heard God speak. <laughs> Brother Bob did our men a great favor. I don't know if our men still realize the favor. Challenge us to read through the Gospel of Matthew. And he says, this is what you need to do, though. When you read through the book, Listen to God. Let God speak to you. He'll say something out of that verse. And when he speaks to you out of the verse, write, write three little short sentences. Just respond to what God said to you. And that's how God would have us to go to this book. Amen? Listen, I want to hear from God. And I can. You need to hear from God. And you can. You know why we why we face so many we face so many situations in life and we can't sense the presence of God because we're not asking God to be with us to show us what to do to help us do His will. They were self confident, and because they're self confident, there was no prayer whatsoever. Hey, listen! If you've got your life figured out and you don't need God, help yourself. Keep on doing what you're doing. But you're going to hit a brick wall sooner or later. Do you hear me? You better learn to get a hold of God. Well, what, what, well preacher, was that there all there was to it? No. There was sin in the camp. They took the accursed thing. You see, what's the accursed thing? Well, God told them when you go to Jericho... Don't take anything to yourself. Everything belongs to me. It's not yours, it's mine. And when Achan saw uh, this uh, great, goodly Babylonian garment, he said, he said, this is the most amazing suit I've ever seen in my life, and it's just my size. This must be a divine appointment. God must have put it here for me. And then he saw some uh, silver, and he saw some gold, and he said, I am set for life. But God had said plainly, don't touch it. Don't take it. If you take it, you'll be accursed. Not only will you be cursed, but the entire nation will be cursed. If they just stopped, Sister Louise, and prayed, God would have said, don't you go forward, AI. Right? Yeah. Brother Phil, Right? There's a problem. Let's deal with that first. 36 men would not have had to lose their life. I'm just trying to get you to see as well, all of us. Why does Satan spend so much time trying to get you to sin? Ever thought about that? Why? Because he wants you to live and not know the presence of God. And I know what some of you are thinking, you saying, Preacher, if, that, if that's what it takes for me not to send it, uh, and, and, and I know some of you may disagree with this, but hear what Jesus said. There are some sins like this sin that's an accursed thing. God said, listen, I've got, I, I promise you I'd deal with this. I told you I would. You took the stuff that was dedicated to me. 
I have to judge this. I, I said, listen, if God didn't judge Achan, that would have made God a liar. And God is not a liar, amen? amen? None of us are going to be perfect. None of us are going to be sinless, but we should be sinning less and less and less. If I just say, Brother West, oh, well, as long as I live in this world, I'm going to sin anyway, and so I might as well just go ahead and sin. I'm never going to experience the uh, presence of God. Amen? But if I'm doing my best to please the Lord, then God will help me to take the next step. Do you know the difference between rebellion just out out and out rebellion. God said don't do it and you do it. Yeah. And then there's this time where you're trying to do God's will and you keep failing and failing. And is there a difference in the both? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. One wants to please God, but he's coming short. The other has no interest in pleasing God whatsoever. And only you know where your heart is. Do you, do you want to live without the presence of God? What separates between you, you, us and God? What, separate, what puts a barrier there? Sin. Is that true? The sin put a barrier between you and God? Yes. What did Isaiah say in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2? Verse 1, he said that God's ear is not, uh, uh, that he cannot hear. His arm is not short and that he cannot save. And then he goes on to verse 2 and says, But your iniquities and sins have separated between you and your God, and he's hid his face from you. Confess your sins. Agree with God that you've broken His law and get it right and fellowship will be restored. How do we know that's true? Did they go fight AI again? When they dealt with the sin issue, did they go fight AI again? Yes. Did they win? Was God with them? Yes. Why is God recording this for us? Because he wants all of us to know if you're doing things that you know that you ought not to do and you're sinning against me, you're not going to sense my presence. You're not going to know my help. You're going to be out there running from the enemy all the time. And God doesn't want that for you. Amen? He wants you to go from victory to victory to victory. If you're here this morning, you don't know Christ as your Savior. <laughs> The first step to take is to come and kneel before Christ and say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I deserve hell, but I want you to save me. Amen? Amen. I believe that you died for me on, on the cross, that you were buried and you rose again. And I want to have a relationship with you. Amen? Amen. But listen to me. If you're a Christian, you know what James tells us to do? If, if our fellowship with God is not what it ought to be, what does James tell us to do? He said to draw near to God. And God will draw near to you. Then what does he say? Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Right? Boy, if you've committed sin, you bring that sin to Jesus and say, Jesus, wash the sin away. Forgive me of my transgressions. I don't want sin anymore. I want you. And Lord, I don't want to be torn between the world and you. I want you. What did John write in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what? Cleanse us from all. Fellowship is restored. When's the last time you felt the presence of God in your life? When's the last time you heard God speak? Does God speak? Absolutely. When's the last time you heard God speak? Something's wrong. What could be wrong, preacher? Maybe you're self-confident. Maybe you're saying, listen, I don't need the Lord's help for this. I can do it. You know what Jesus said? Without me, you can do nothing. nothing. Amen? Maybe it's because... There's no supplications. What did James say in James uh, chapter 4 again? You have not because you... 
And then the next verse he said, you ask amiss just to satisfy your own fleshly cravings. That's not the quote, but that's the intent of that next verse. No supplication. Or what if, what if it's this? What if it's sin? What did David say about iniquity? He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Right? There's something in my heart that God said, you got to give that up. And I'm saying, Lord, I don't want to give that up. I, 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 I kind of want to hold on to that. I, I, I like that. And he said, all right. If you really want it that way, I'm going silent. You're not going to sense my presence. When you fight the enemy, how many of you want to fight the devil by yourself? I don't want to fight the devil by my. You know why? Because he would destroy me. If I fight him by myself, I can't beat him. Christ can. I don't want to fight him by myself because he would he would kill he'd destroy me. He'd destroy my family. He'd ruin my faith. I need Christ. Amen. But if you've got sin in your life, you're not going to sense the Savior's help to defeat the devil. You don't want that, amen? amen. What I'm trying to do, we're looking at Resurrection Sunday coming up here shortly. What I'm trying to give you is a desire on your own to walk with God. Have an intimate fellowship with Him. To be obedient to Him. To get to know Him better. You know, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if um, all of us knew more about Jesus, or were closer to Jesus Christ, or listening to Christ and obeying Christ? Well, I tell you, that'd be an amazing church, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, it starts with me doing that. And then a few more of us have to do that as well. Amen? So that God would be here, present, Amen. working. Oh, I desire that. I hope you do too. Amen. If you're not saved, come to Jesus this morning. There's something in your life that's hindering you from knowing God's presence. If you come to Jesus this morning, give that to Jesus as well. Amen. Let God have his way in your life. Would you do that? Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. and Thank you for your Holy Spirit. It's been somewhat of an unusual morning. But Lord, you are able to take even the unusual things and use them to get our attention. And I, I ask you, Jesus, this morning, there are any in, among us that are lost. God, would you awaken them to their need of Christ today? Would you show them if they died in their current condition, they'd spend eternity in hell? And would you call them Call them to Christ this morning that they might have life. Lord, if there are believers here this morning, there's something wrong in their heart. They are ignoring you. They're trying to live the Christian life independent of you. Help them to see it's impossible. It's like the army going against the AI. There's only defeat in that. We need to acknowledge we need you always. I cannot even take my next breath. Lord, without you granting me that breath, how can I do anything else? And Lord, help them to come and say, Jesus, I need you. I want you in my life. I want you to have your way in my life. Lord, if there's prayerlessness, and so often I've been guilty of that myself, I pray you'd help us to come to this altar and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm not seeking your face or your will. I'm making so many decisions. And it's causing or trouble and heartache. And I, I, I pray, God, that you'd help us this morning get things right with you. And Lord, if there's sin in our life, help us to run to this altar and say, no more. I'd rather have Jesus than this sin. Lord, have your way in this invitation and be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. 
Amen. Let's turn to page 272. 272. God's dealt with your heart.